Om Agana Tvina Dasya Gananjana Salakaya Chaksuram Lilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Maum Vishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutte Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tanamane Namaste Saraswatunde Ve Gauravani Bacharane Nirvishesha Srinivadi Asgadya De Sadharane I'd like to begin by just narrating about one time I was with Srila Prabhupada on Janmasami, which is in New Vrindavan, which the date was probably around 1972. And New Vrindavan at that time was the place of pilgrimage for practically all the devotees in ISKCON, which, which weren't that many, a hundred devotees or so, maybe more than that. And at that time they were opening up a new temple, I guess uh, the Vrindavan temple which is about the size, half the size of this temple. And Prabhupada was sitting there, I was sitting right in front of Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada started, I believe around 11 o'clock at night. Now, could you, when you have, I don't know how many devotees are here, but when you have a temple half the size of this, and you have 150 devotees in it, and it's, you're fasting the whole day, and I was cooking the whole day also because... And then suddenly, uh, there's no air in the temple. <laughs> I remember that clearly. There's no air, so we couldn't breathe, which was a problem. <laughs> Especially when you're used to breathing. <laughs> and Prabhupada was sitting there, and he asked someone to read the Krishna book. Which I thought was very nice, I always liked the Krishna book. So it started, we started around 11 o'clock at night, then there was 12 o'clock at night, then it was 1 o'clock at night, and they kept on reading the Krishna book, chapter after chapter, beginning with the first chapter. And after a couple hours, my attention faded, as my consciousness was fading. And by the third hour, it was around 2 o'clock in the morning, and Prabhupada looked around and said, oh, you're tired? He was looking at all of <laughs> And he said, go take prasadam. So that was around three o'clock in the morning. And uh, there was a huge line, because not everyone stayed in the temple. There was this big line. And I was at the end of the line. <laughs> I remember that clearly. <laughs> No, that wasn't the last time. I was, I had that experience a number of times. <laughs> First time was when I w was in. I went to the twenty-six. Well, it was sixty-one Second Avenue. It was a Sunday feast because I used to go after my when I was at home for co for my college vacation. My parents were living in Brooklyn, so I'd go and visit them, and then I go down to the temple. So when they were at 61 and 2nd Avenue, I went there for feast. I think it was, you know, it was, and uh, for the Sunday feast, everyone lined up. The devotees lined up in the front. The guests were all the way in the back. And I didn't know the secret at that time. <laughs> so I was in the back with the guests. And then but by the time it got to the guests and myself, all the prasadam was gone. <laughs> And there was one devotee named Rohini, uh, Rohini Kumara, and he took me in the back. What's that? He took me in the back and gave me some Simply Wonderfuls. So that's why I'm still here. <laughs> Otherwise I would have died out of envy. <laughs> so anyhow, at that time, there was absolutely nothing. <laughs> and my friend who we joined the movement together, well, we joined the movement together and we were friends in college. He was at GBC at that time. So they brought him a plate and he decided not to give me anything. <laughs> I won't mention his name to protect him. <laughs> Anyhow, that was my, that was one of the times I was with Shula Prabhupada. But, the difficulty with in speaking about Krishna and Janmasmi 
is that it would be helpful if, we actually, if I actually knew Krishna. Not that I don't know anything about Krishna, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> None of us would be here. But to actually know Krishna is not such a simple thing. Because after all, Krishna, we can say, we, or as uh, one of the great devotees said, someone says they know Krishna, and someone else may say they know Krishna, but as far as, this is Lord Brahma, as far as I know, I don't really know anything about Krishna. So if Lord Brahma says he doesn't know really very much about Krishna, what can I say? But we can attempt to say something. And because there's some faith that the words about Krishna are not different from Krishna, therefore they may have some effect on myself and others that I may speak to. Or as when Sri Prabhupada was on the Daladuta coming to the United States, when he, before he arrived, he wrote one poem, and in the poem he mentions that actually I'm coming here by the mercy of my guru, and I'm praying that my words may become transcendently potent, they can enter into the hearts of the conditioned souls and enliven them with this transcendental message. In other words, Krishna is the transcendental message, and he's using all of us in order to enter into hearts of others, in order to enliven them and enlighten them in Krishna consciousness. And then Prabhupada said, actually I'm a poor beggar, uh, so far away from Vrindavan. He said, but I've come here because on the order of my Guru Maharaj, and therefore make me dance, make me dance, make me dance, like Chandramali Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada was, was praying that he could become an instrument in the hands of Krishna. Because Srila Prabhupada was always a perfect instrument, but to set the example, and besides that being a perfect instrument doesn't mean that you know exactly that you're empowered and that you're going to save everyone. You know exactly what to do. Perfect instrument means you put yourselves in Krishna's hand, you don't really know what the result is going to be. And therefore you're always in that humble state of relying upon Krishna intensely. Just to say another story, in 1969 when Prabhupada came to Buffalo, well not to Buffalo, he did come to Buffalo in 69, but in, he came to Boston and Prabhupada was one of the times when Prabhupada walked into the temple, it was a temple which was our new, uh, the new Boston Temple on Beacon Street, which was, again, it wasn't super large, it was around half the size of this temple. But then again, their number of devotees were half the size too. So they fit in. And Prabhupada walked up the steps of the temple to get to the temple because it was... Uh, on two floors, which was the first temple that I know of in Iskand, which had two floors. So it was a skyscraper. <laughs> and Prabhupada walked up, as I have said before, the whole temple became Vaikuntha. And then afterwards, Prabhupada went back to it. He wasn't staying at the temple. There was no place for him to stay. But he went back to the apartment that he was staying in, and Purushetam came back and told us, the Prabhupada stood at the, the front of his bed and then he fell back onto, his, onto the bed and he rolled over and, and he said, I pray to Krishna every night to please protect me from Maya. So that's the qualification of a pure devotee. He's always depending on Krishna, never thinking that somehow or another I'm a pure devotee and therefore I'm free to think about Krishna or not think about Krishna, or Krishna will always give me his mercy, I don't have to worry about anything. So that dependency is what we're trying to develop, and that comes from the process of devotional service. So as I was reading today, knowing Krishna is a revelation, and that revelation depends upon our attitude. 
an attitude of service. And to develop that attitude of service, we need the association of devotees, devotees where we can practice devotional service in a, the proper attitude. That is to recognize the superior devotees and try to find, even in devotees that may not be that superior to us in every respect, try to see the good qualities in the devotees. Try to see the devotees that are more or less on the same level in some ways that we are and try to cooperate with them in those services. And also, probably equally important or the most important, is under the guidance of those superior devotees, we learn how to cooperate with other devotees and we learn how to honor devotees within our minds, even if they don't, aren't as strict in the process of devotional service. So the topmost devotee makes or breaks our, our relationship with the topmost devotees, breaks or makes our relationship with all the other devotees. If we think we have some relationship with others outside of our relationship with those other, the topmost devotees, then our relationship will somehow or another become distorted. It won't be in Krishna consciousness. So, Prabhupada said that this attitude of humility to Krishna, because the topmost devotee must be, in our minds at least, the perfect representative of Krishna, the best representative of Krishna. As Prabhupada was installing Rukmini Dwarkadish, Rukmini Dwarkanath in Los Angeles in 1970, 70 actually, our first installation of Radha Krishna Deities in the movement. And there, Prabhupada talk, started to talk about the relationship between, well, first of all, he mentioned about Halava. It wasn't the first thing in the, in the, in the talk, but anyhow, he mentioned Halava, the next to the last part of the talk. Halava was a big factor in our society at that time. I mean, many devotees stayed in the movement because of halava. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> and halava was especially pro glorious, was especially honored if it had fruit in it. Somehow or another, devotees like to put fruit in, sometimes apples, but usually raisins. And probably like golden raisins for, for some reason. When he saw black raisins in the halava, he said, why do they have ants in the halava? Why do they have insects in the halava? <laughs> they burnt. <laughs> Anyhow, probably mentions that when you're all, it's Krishna, he doesn't need your fruity halava, which was like probably a shock to many of the devotees in the audience. <laughs> and then probably started to mention about Vansi Vas Babaji, and then Bhansi Babaji was a Mahabhagava who had a relationship of a parental relation with Krishna, a very intimate relationship. But then Prabhupada stopped. It was probably too much an intimate relationship for inti intimate relationship for the devotees at that time with Krishna. So then he started to mention about Sanatana Goswami. So he said, Sanatana Goswami, he was hanging his deity in the tree. Just a little background, as you probably know, there was one Brahmin in Mathura and he had some sons and he had a deity named Madan Mohan. And one night Madan Mohan came to the Brahmin in a dream and said, tomorrow there will be a great devotee coming here and he's going, I want you to give me to him. So the Brahmin was shocked, oh my God, you're my son, how can I give you? He said, well, he doesn't have any sons. He's all by himself. And I, I want to live with him for some time. So the Brahmin said, okay. Because Madan Mohan, the relationship he had with the Brahmin and with the Brahmin's children is that sometimes he'd be on the altar and sometimes he'd go out and play with the children. It was a very intimate relationship. So it was a great shock for this Brahmin to give up Madan Mohan. 
And so, not, so Sanatana Goswami was doing Madhakari, he was going from door to door, well, there was no doors in there. From, <laughs> he was going from hut to hut, if, if he could find one. And he was getting some, trying to beg some rotis. So as I mentioned many times, roti didn't mean a chapati with ghee on it. You know, nicely rolled out and put on the fire and puffed up. Roti meant they, gr they ground with a rock probably, some some wheat that was growing, probably wild. They ground it into some kind of flour. They put some water in it, try to get into a dough, and then throw it into an open fire. It hopes that most of it got cooked. I mean, half of it would get burned and half of it would be raw. And that would be your prashadam for the day. So that was what Madan Mohan, that's what Sanatana Goswami was going around and offering, or it was begging from the Brahmins at that time. So he came to the house and this Brahmin said, last night I had a dream and Madan Mohan, my deity, wants to live with you. So Sanatana Goswami said, wait a second. He said, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it's exactly, you know, five-star hotel he's going to get. <laughs> he said, I'm living underneath the tree. No, he said, the Brahmin said, no, no, he, Sanat, Madan Mohan said, no, he said he wants to live with you. He didn't say what kind of accommodation he needs. You, you just take him, and then you know, I guess he'll accept whatever you give him. So Sanatana Goswami took the deity, and he put him on, a, on the branch of the tree, where the Madan Mohan temple is now. So after some time, Madan Mohan started to complain. And he said, Sanatana Goswami, he said, you know, every day you're giving me these dry rotis. He said, can't you even give me a little salt or something? I mean, it's difficult enough living in a tree, on a branch of a tree, but at least I should get something to eat. And Sanatana Goswami said, my dear Madan Mohan, he said, I'm an old man. I can hardly move. But whatever I get, I offer to you. So, please accept it. And the Prophet started to chuckle. And he said, Madan Mohan had to eat it. <laughs> and he said, but what is your value? The Prophet was saying. And what is the value of the things that you have? It is nothing. That the real thing is bhakti. That Krishna kindly take. I have no qualifications. I'm rotten and I'm fallen. And then Prabhupada started to cry, but I brought this to you. And then Prabhupada said, don't be puffed up. Always remembering that you're dealing with Krishna. That is my advice to you. Thank you. So Krishna is so kind that he's come to us in the form of the deities. He's come to us in the form of the holy name. He's even coming to us in the form of the devotees. And if we have the proper attitude, then Krishna will reveal to us himself in those different forms. And if we don't have the proper attitude, then we'll never see the then Krishna will never reveal to us in those forms, either the form of the deity, or the form of the holy name, or the form of the the books, or in the form of the the atmosphere that we create when we're preaching and when we're trying to, trying to create the atmosphere in our homes or in the temples that we're in, the spiritual atmosphere, or in the association of the devotees. And even if we're... So therefore, it's our attitude. As soon as... I mean, anyone who does book distribution will know that if you go, when I usually used to go out there to the airports in Chicago, as Maharaj mentioned Chicago, Chicago is a difficult place. All the, even back 30 years ago, it was a difficult place. And Chicago airport was especially a difficult place. Not the nicest people came by. At least what I thought was nice. In any case, I used to go out there in anxiety. I didn't want to be, well, after sometimes you get used to it. But at the beginning, I was, I was a bit of anxiety. I didn't want to be there. People wouldn't stop, whatever. 
and then you become humbled. And as soon as you became humbled and praying to Krishna, oh, let me give a better example. I, I, was, I was sent to Houston, Texas, 1970, in the beginning, at the end of 1970, to help open a temple in Houston, Texas, with Vishnu Jai Maharaj and his servant Srina. And I was, the, I was the only one who knew how to collect. And if I didn't collect, we didn't eat. Not, not only we didn't eat, but we didn't have any place to stay, and we didn't have any, it was cold sometimes. So I was out there, and I was in Texas. Texas was a place where people used to, uh, were not very tolerant. There was a class of people in Texas you should take black people and hang them from trees. And we were not exactly <laughs> from the black people. Matter of fact, when I was hitchhiking to go there from Florida, the police stopped me on the way. Like they stopped Vishnu, Jai Maharaj, and Srina. And they at the first, I was dressed like, the, you know, it's with a dhoti and whatever, with shaven head. And they asked me, hey boy, why are you dressed like that? <laughs> They arrested Srinath and Vishnu Jai Maharaj and put them in jail for a while. Me, they got used to the Jyoti, so they let me go. And actually, the first time I went out in book distribution in, in uh, like this, not downtown, but door to door, in Dallas, they arrested us and charged us for, for imitating women. <laughs> they put us in jail over, week, over the weekend. And Yusa, when they arrested us the first time, <laughs> and Yusa, when they arrested me the first time, we went out there, and immediately when we went out to do Harinam, they arrested us, took us to jail, and they were, I was there, I was chanting, and the God said, stop that. So I thought he was in Maya, so I said, started to chant louder. And he took out his gun. He wasn't going to shoot me, he was going to hit me with it. So I realized maybe I should chant a little softer. <laughs> In any case, it was a place which was not very receptive, but we, we, were on tri we actually went on trial on the television. They put us on trial on television before the city, the city council had a trial on television. We weren't probably the only one that city. It was like a city council, council hearing on television. And Vishnu Jamar was there to represent us. And during the trial, one man walked up to one of the people in the audience and said, I'll give you $50 if you hit the monk on television. So the man happened to be a reporter, and he went before the city council and said that I just got offered $50 to hit this monk in front of the television set. So it was a big embarrassment for the city council and they dismissed our case. <laughs> so then we could go out and I could go out every day. Vishnu Jan Maharaj, if you ever heard of Vishnu Jan Maharaj, he was, he was a Gandharva, he was singing, but he had, knew nothing at all about selling anything. Tamil Krishna Maharaj used to complain later on that Vishnu Jan Maharaj, he doesn't know how to distribute books at all. And Prabhupada said, well, Vishnu Jai Maharaj went back to Godhead by chanting. So anyhow, he used to stand out there with the back to Godhead, with like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, if you ever saw them. He wouldn't say a word to anyone. <laughs> so at the end of the day, he, he was sincere. I mean, just to stand there for some time, not say anything, is quite austere, especially in Texas. But he didn't sell anything. I was the only one who could sell anything. So I'd go out there and people, they thought I was from out of space. I mean, literally from out of space. So, you know, trying to stop them was like trying to stop, stop a truck running into you. So the only, I concluded after some time because I was suffering, the only thing to do was to pray to Krishna because there was no other way of doing anything out here. So I'd, sit, I'd just be out there praying, oh Krishna, send someone, send something. Someone, someone would go, they'd tap me on the shoulder and say, what do you have in your hand? 
He said, well, you know, you don't want it. He said, no, show it to me. So you give it to me. How much is it? And then they buy the book. And they go, okay, Krishna, please send someone else. <laughs> so that, that was my, one of the most valuable lessons I got on book distribution. I couldn't do anything by myself. Of course, later on, what would happen is when I became a little more expert at selling things, and then really ex you know, pretty expert at selling things, then I started to actually imagine that I actually had some potency. And as soon as I thought like that, you know, because after a while you develop some kind of potency, you go, excuse me, sir, and they just stop. So wow, wow, I'm really empowered. <laughs> I got the potency. <laughs> and then I think, wow, I'm really empowered. And, and suddenly, excuse me, sir, st wait a second, you're supposed to stop. <laughs> what do you mean, what, what are you telling me to get a job, you know? <laughs> Excuse me, sir, stop. I said, okay, Krishna. <laughs> Help. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, okay, stop. Thank you. <laughs> so that was a lesson. We have to depend upon Krishna. Of course, I never fully learned the lesson. I'm still learning the lesson. Because book distribution is a great, is a great place to learn those lessons. Because otherwise... You, Forget it, unless you're super empowered or you really have an intense desire. I mean, but generally speaking, if you really want, if you were as un untalented as I was at selling things, you know, you have to learn the lesson that depending upon Krishna. And without that, I was like lost because we had no lines. We had absolutely no idea of how to sell anything. And no one was there to teach us either. It was just me, the people, and Krishna. And the only way you could do it is depend upon Krishna. So similarly, in whatever we're doing, it's not like book distribution, Krishna is there, and we have an opportunity to depend upon Krishna, and when Krishna is not there, we can do whatever we want. And somehow or another, we're going to be able to accomplish something. But book distribution is an opportunity, or other kinds of services, where we have to depend upon Krishna, where we it's demanding that we depend upon Krishna, or else it, we don't get it right. Or as I asked one time, as I've said before, I asked Sri Prabhupada, if Krishna wants me to do something, or if Krishna doesn't want me to do something, how will I know what Krishna wants me to do? So Prabhupada looked at me and started to laugh, and said, you won't know what to do. He said, you'll do the wrong thing. And everyone else started to laugh too, all the other devotees. And then Prabhupada gave me this glance of compassion because he didn't want me to get upset. Because Prabhupada, I mean, my relation with Prabhupada was usually either super kind to me or sarcastic, especially when I asked. <laughs> Every question I asked Prabhupada, he, was always, he always gave me a sarcastic answer to it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> in any case that's, our, that's what we're here for is to learn that Krishna is there and as much as we depended upon him and whatever we're doing then Krishna will reveal himself to us and if we do we have a glorious service and we don't depend upon Krishna uh, the worst thing is we do something extra which is what we consider what others consider extraordinary and then we actually started thinking we're extraordinary that's the greatest danger of becoming an initiating spiritual master in iskon nowadays other people think you're extraordinary and then you start thinking yeah maybe i am extraordinary you know, when you get so much prayer, just like one man was walking along. And he heard, Mr. So-and-so, you become a ghost. And then he walked along a little further and someone else was there to play the same trick on him. And said, Mr. Patel, what happened to you? You became a ghost. And after some time, all these people lined up to bewilder Mr. Patel. And he said, my God, i become a ghost. So enough people tell you, oh, you're fantastic, your kirtans are wonderful, you have the greatest classes, you know, you're my heart and soul. 
from you ecstatic prem name mates. May it you ignorance is destroyed. Your I depend on your hundred percent of your mercy. Say, yeah. I never thought of myself like that. <laughs> And then someone else, then if you get in the right circumstances, someone will say, hey, hey kid, get lost, get a job. <laughs> someone will reveal to you, you know, make, bring, whoo, wow, getting close to ten, one ten thousandth the size, tip here in size. Before I was the universal form. <laughs> I'm getting closer to reality. So we have that dependency upon Krishna, then we'll gradually realize that we're actually not the doer. It's just that when we depend upon our spiritual master in disciple succession, his instructions, his mercy, and ultimately the mercy that he can give, give us coming from our acharyas in disciple succession through Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, then the result is that Krishna can reciprocate and reveal something to us. It may not be a huge revelation, a little tiny insight into reality and that makes our day then we realize oh yeah krishna is there actually this philosophy is true and i can actually become krishna conscious i'm taking a step now but one step after another so Prabhupada said if we're when a child is young and he's take, start trying to walk and he falls down the parents don't go hey kid you know it took me three times this is your fourth time are you sure you're my, my child you know, my kids don't fall down like that. No, the, the parents are very compassionate. No matter how many times the child falls down, the parents are encouraging him to get up and try and walk again. Of course, if he's 50 years old, parents may get a little concerned. <laughs> but they, <laughs> they encourage him. And one day he'll actually learn how to walk. And not only he'll learn how to walk, one day he'll dance, and if he's in Krishna consciousness, he'll dance in ecstasy. So we're just trying to make little baby steps. And the most important thing is just relying upon Krishna, relying upon Krishna's devotees, relying upon our acharyas and the succession, and seeing ourselves as simply their instruments, and always steadily trying to rely upon them more and more and more, realizing that actually uh, we're not as great as our false ego tells us to be. We're actually in a process of discovering how wonderful Krishna is, how wonderful his devotees are, and the more we find out how wonderful they are, then we'll, we'll find out who we actually are too. Thank you. Hare Krishna. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> say something. Say something, okay. All right, Krishna. Okay. After that lecture, I feel like taking Prashad. <laughs> Even before just, the lecture, I felt like taking Prashad. <laughs> we had to follow the program. No. <laughs> just to get back to normal. <laughs> So he just told me how incompetent I am, so <laughs> I've taken that lecture to heart, so now I'm afraid to say anything. <laughs> You've learned more than I did. <laughs> and uh, I'm, it's a good, good, good lesson. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatyade Satarine Vanchakalpa Thiru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Vaibhacha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Nama Om Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare And Srila Prabhupada would like to often when he 
uh, approached this subject of John Mastami, he would always quote this one verse from the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tattvataha taktva deham purna janmani naiti mam eti sarjuna. And what Prabhupada would illustrate is that to know Krishna is the perfection of one's devotional service. And of course he would also say it's impossible to know Krishna. <laughs> so apparently there was some a contradiction that it's not possible to know Krishna. As Maharaj said, quoting Lord Brahma, Brahma says, some people say they know you, and that is very nice. But as far as I'm concerned, I know nothing about you. <laughs> so coming from the most powerful personality in the universe, Brahmaji, who was directly empowered by Krishna to create the different bodies of the living entities, He's saying, I don't know anything about you. So, but Prabhupada also said, that, quoting this verse, that by understanding the essence of this verse, which means that one who knows the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord's birth and activities in this world, immediately is eligible to return to the spiritual world. So how do we develop that, uh, that qualification to actually enter into the spiritual world based on knowing Krishna? So knowing Krishna means, really, it's simple, to absorb oneself in hearing about Krishna. At least we can get some indication. And when Srila Prabhupada was giving one lecture, he was saying, and he said, to go back home to Godhead, you have to be fully Krishna conscious. And then there was a complete dead silence in the crowd. Everyone looked scared, bewildered. And Prabhupada said, all right, 90% Krishna conscious. <laughs> and when the guru gives some concession, Krishna goes along with that, especially a spiritual master like Srila Prabhupada. But there was no change in the mood of the crowd. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, all right, 80%. <laughs> and then there was some little smiles starting to move, but not much. And Prabhupada could understand he was still making it too hard. All right, he said, 70%. And then he said, no less than that, and he walked off. <laughs> so even that is considered to be a, a great achievement, to develop that much awareness of the nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, one thing we know about Krishna, he's kind. That one we can understand. And he, how does he show his kindness? He shows his kindness by empowering his the devotees to do the work that he could easily do simply by desiring it. When Prabhupada uh, was asked, he said, "Was Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he spread Krishna consciousness throughout the entire subcontinent of India. You know, we, we hear about how he left Jagannath Puri and for 18 years traveled all the way down to the southern part of uh, India, Cape Comoran, and went down the, the western eastern side and came all the way around and went back up the eastern side, crossed over in the area of Bombay and then went back to Jagannath Puri. It took him 18 years. And during those 18 years, everybody he met he simply inspired them to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And it's as described, when one person would, would be inspired by Lord Chaitanya, they would inspire someone else, and that person would inspire someone else. And that person would continue to inspire others. And pretty soon, it was mentioned that practically the whole subcontinent of India became Krishna conscious because of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So knowing that, the devotees asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, why did he just stop there? Why didn't he just do the whole world? <laughs> he was God, he could have did it. Prabhupada said he left it for me to do. <laughs> so that was the indication that actually Krishna can do anything. And he, of course, there was this one, uh, it was a trick question when Prabhupada was in London 
Shamsundar was asked by Prabhupada, bring as many important people as you can. I want to speak Krishna consciousness to people who have positions. And so people who were coming were, you know, some they were Donovan, who was a rock and roll personality at that time. <laughs> if you know anything about Donovan, he was quite uh, avant-garde, you can might say. And then there was others, there was poets, and there was uh, writers, and there was people who had some, some influence in the world. And they were coming, and then one group came, they were called the Mensa Society, M-E-N-S-A. And their whole bro program is they were armchair philosophers. <laughs> they would sit around, pick a subject, and just discuss it. And, Threadbare, try to get as much understanding of a subject as they could. And that was their whole program, you know, half-baked intellectuals, you know, <laughs> just sitting around discussing. So they came to meet Prabhupada, and one of them said, Prabhupada was talking, well, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is all-powerful. There is nothing he cannot do. And then one of them asked a question to Prabhupada, Swamiji, if he cannot, if he's, if he is like that, can he create a rock he can't lift? <laughs> so, I mean, that was a trick question. If you say yes, that means you, you know, limit his creating power and lifting power. And if you say no, you limit his creating power. So Prabhupada, you know, don't try to play tricks on Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada said, he'll create a rock he can't lift, and then he'll lift it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so Prabhupada was showing us that uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he can do anything. In fact, Prabhupada could make the whole world Krishna conscious. But he likes to empower his devotees. He likes to give his devotees the opportunity to serve on his behalf, he provides, the Lord will provide the situation. As it's described, sometimes he appears in a dream of his devotee and says, my temple's in disrepair, can you fix it? And the devotee thinks, oh, the Lord wants me to fix his temple. So the devotee's thinking how to do it. And he's got the desire, but what happens? Krishna supplies the, the materials, the finances, everything, and the devotee makes the temple nice, and Krishna's pleased, everyone's pleased, and, Krish and the, the Bodhi gets the credit. So Krishna does that. He'll empower his devotees to do so many wonderful things, which for him, it's so easy to do. That's Krishna. There's one beautiful story where when uh, Krishna was in Dwarka. This is right after the battle of Kurukshetra. And King Yudhisthira was there. And I, they were also planning to uh, arrange for the Rajasuya sacrifice, which would consummate uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj to sit on the throne. In other words, he had to establish his supremacy by performing this very elaborate and costly sacrifice which means to subjugate all of the kings in the world to his rule and at the same time amass great amounts of wealth in order to facilitate this great sacrifice. So it would, they were preparing for that, but this time they were in Dwarka with Krishna. And of course, uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj, he had asked Krishna, you become the personality that we honor during the sacrifice. You become the most important person. And Krishna accepted. So that was the plan. Now Krishna was in Dwarka to settle the affairs of Dwarka, and he was in the assembly with many of the leaders of the, of the society of Dwarka. And there was a big meeting, and during the meeting, one messenger comes to the door, and he has a very urgent message for Krishna. And the person at the door stops him and says, what do you have? He said, oh, I have this urgent message. I have to deliver it to Krishna. Can I speak to Krishna? So the, the, mess, the, the guard at the door notifies Krishna. And Krishna says, yes, I'll have him speak. So he comes forward. He says, well, um, my dear Lord, I have a letter. And this letter is from the kings who have been imprisoned by Jarasandha. 
and they're in great anxiety. And then he reads the letter, my dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of God, O most powerful one, O most compassionate one, we are suffering under the hands of Jairus under it. And he is about to perform a human sacrifice with us. We are about to lose our lives. And we are praying, please come and save us. It was really a heartfelt plea for how Krishna to come and save him. And uh, so Krishna's listening to that, and then Uddhava's there. Uddhava's Krishna's cousin. Krishna's father was Vasudev. Vasudev had many brothers, and one of his brothers was the father of Uddhava. And so Krishna and Uddhava were cousins. But Uddhava was also a great devotee of Krishna. So Krishna turns to Uddhava and says, what should we do? Because they were planning for the Rajasuya sacrifice. Now these kings are calling out for help. What should we do? Now obviously Krishna knows what to do. And so he, uh, he turns to Uddhava and says, Uddhava, what do we do? <laughs> and Uddhava says, well, my dear Lord, as long as Jarasandha is alive, we cannot perform the Rajasuya sacrifice successful. So you must kill Jarasandha. Jai Uddhava! <laughs> he came up with the perfect answer. Everyone could, applauded Uddhava's intelligence. And Krishna's just smiling, <laughs> knowing that that was the answer anyway. <laughs> that was an example in the Shastras how the Lord, he can, he can do anything, he can figure out. Of course, if he's God, obviously he knows everything, past, present, and future. He knows the hearts of all living beings. He knows when we're going to go back home. He knows whether we're going to make it in this life or not. He knows whether, whether we are actually going to uh, take more prashadam tonight than we need. <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> he's just all-knowing. But still, he's very kind to his devotees because he's always sending messages in different ways to his devotees how a devotee should proceed in their Krishna consciousness in order to make progress in their devotional life. So that's the mercy of Krishna. And so he's very enthusiastic to give his devotee credit for things that he can do so easily and so naturally without even, it says, parasya shakti vidhaya suyate svabhaviki jnana balakriya Krishna, all he has to do, if he wants something to happen, he just thinks about it and it happens. And he doesn't have to move, he doesn't do, do anything. As soon as he thinks, all of his energies, according to the, the nature of his desire, they go into action and things happen. That's Krishna. If we know a little bit about how Krishna works, then we're starting to develop those qualities which will allow us to ultimately free ourselves from this cycle of birth and death. And so, as Prabhupada was making this point, to know Krishna and his nature and his, the way he deals with his devotees, the way he performs his activities of appearing in this world. Like he appears in this world as a little innocent child who takes birth from a lady and also he has a father. But his birth is divine, it's called Dibya. It is not a birth like we take a birth in this world. Uh, the comparison is used just like, it's a nice analogy. We see the sun, it rises over the eastern horizon. It, you know, trans, through the transform, it goes, you know, goes through the sky. And then again, it disappears over the rest the western horizon. So we call that sunrise and we call that sunset. But that there's no such thing as sunrise and sunset. That's just a word we use from our perspective. But the sun doesn't rise, the sun doesn't set. It's always in its orbit somewhere in the universe. And from our perspective, we see it as sunrise and sunset. So when Krishna appears, he is just performing his activities in one place, and then he goes to another place and performs those activities somewhere else. But he is always performing his activities in the material world. It's like Prabhupada said, 
you know, you can go into another universe and you can also join Krishna in his appearance as he performs his Janmasthami in that particular universe. So it's like a clockwork, and like Prabhupada would say. And just like he would use the example, like right now it's almost 8 o'clock. He would say, somewhere in the world it's 8 o'clock, and even if it becomes 9 o'clock where we are, it's still 8 o'clock somewhere else. And if it becomes 1 o'clock where we are, it's still 8 o'clock somewhere else. So 8 o'clock is always there, somewhere in the world. So in the same way, Krishna appears and disappears in different universes to perform his activities. And that is called divyam, it's divine. But how he does that? <laughs> That is his, what we say, internal power, that if we get a little understanding of Krishna, in other words, he does it for, we know the reasons why he does it. He does it to please his devotees. He does this to give association to his internal uh, parts and parcels, such as Nanda Maharaj and the Mother Yasoda. He comes to dance in the Rasa dance. It says one of the reasons Krishna takes birth in, in this uh, particular universe is to go to Vrindavan and engage in Madhurya Ras, Sringara Ras. He likes to enjoy with his devotees in the material world to bring their consciousness completely absorbed in him in that loving relationship. But he enjoys also. <laughs> In fact, Krishna does everything for his own enjoyment. <laughs> That's a point that if we can understand that, that whatever he does, he does it for his own enjoyment. Whether he kills the demons, creates something, destroys something, or whatever he does, you know, he's always doing it for his own enjoyment. And Prabhupada uses the example. It's a nice little example, is that You'll see there's paintings on the wall. So we can take, you know, uh, some joy and some happiness and some experience of looking at these beautiful paintings of Krishna. But the artist who created it, created it for his own enjoyment. And Prabhupada uses that example that when someone creates something or does something, they do it for their own enjoyment, but they invite others to enjoy also. So Krishna invites us to take part in his activities. And so this Janmastami is just as good as the time when Krishna appeared in his original form as Janmastami 5,000 years ago. Why? Because it is transcendental, it's divyam. Only thing is he's not personally manifested on this material plane, but he is somewhere else on another material plane performing that same activities. So John Mastami is a constant feature of Krishna's Leela to uh, give pleasure to his devotees, as he says in the Bhagavad Gita, to uh, eliminate the demoniac forces in the world. Uh, the material world is a place where there's always problems. Prabhupada said, Maya, we have no problem with Maya. He said, Maya is our friend. But he said, because there are demons, she has to do our, there's her service, therefore there's always difficulties, only because of the demons. But we have no problem with Maya, because we just chant Hare Krishna, and Maya, Maya says, oh, they're chanting Hare Krishna. Then they're okay, I won't bother them. <laughs> as soon as you stop chanting Hare Krishna, and you think, as Maharaj was saying, well, you know, I've made so many advancement of chanting Hare Krishna. I've been chanting for 50 years. I think I should take a year break, you know, go to Dubrovnik and uh, just uh, sit down on the shore and, you know, take out my suntan lotion and just look at the waves. And after a, uh, a month, or after a few months, I'll be back and chant Hare Krishna. Forget it. <laughs> There was one story. So um, this is a, a nice point to make. Don't ever take a break in Krishna consciousness because if you break in Krishna consciousness, you break. <laughs> Krishna consciousness is something that you have to continue to do 24-7 in order for it to become successful. 
It's mentioned in the Padma Purana that if if you forget Krishna for one moment, one moment, it says to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment, and then the verse goes on, that is the greatest mistake, that is the greatest anomaly, that is the greatest misfortune, to forget the Supreme Personality. Because the soul can never forget. The mind interferes with the soul's existence and creates an illusion of happiness based on trying to enjoy this material world. That is called Maya. <laughs> that is called Maya. So, taking a break in Krishna consciousness means to actually give up Krishna consciousness, because Maya will sometimes say, you know, you've made so much nice advancement, you've been chanting so nicely. Just like sometimes we think, well, I've done so much nice service, I've worked so hard, and people say, oh, thank you, uh, Prabhu, thank you, Mataji, you're doing so nice service. So I should give myself a little reward. <laughs> so Brahma, there was one incident where Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, one of his leading sannyasis, and he was a, gr a great preacher, but on this one occasion he went out and he astounded the audience with his, with his pravacha. Mm -hmm. It was so powerful. And then he got a standing ovation. Everyone got up, and there were hundreds of people there listening to him. And they also were clapping and clapping and clapping, and they continued to clap. It was amazing what he had said, and they inspired the people in such a powerful way. So then, after, he was thinking, hmm, I should reward myself. That was pretty good. <laughs> so he was thinking, I'll have to get some special prasadam for that. So he organized some cooks to give him some really special prasadam. I mean, if it was me, I would say, just make me pizza, you know, or something, <laughs> or something similar, or, or spaghetti, ravioli, gnocchi, lasagna, pasta. Mamma mia. <laughs> yeah, so, the, you know, I'm just giving you a little hint just in case you forget. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to do that, but <laughs> I do things I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> and so when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had heard that this uh, sannyasi was now thinking he needs to get some you know, reward for his uh, successful preaching. He said, who does he think he is? He's serving on behalf of the Supreme Lord. Krishna says, uh, I am the ability in all living entities. Rasoham apsukuntiya prabhasmi sasi surya pranava sarvavedishu sabdike purusham nishu sabdike purusham nishu means I am the ability in all living entities. And Krishna emphasizes that again, Sarvasita Hamridi Sanivitsa, Matat Smita Gyanam Apohanam Sha. If you want knowledge, it comes from me. If you want remembrance, I give you that. And if you want to forget me, or if you want to forget something, I also help you do that. You can't do any of these unless I sanction it. Yeah. So Krishna is every is is all powerful and he's all pervading in all aspects of existence but he gives us our independence and therefore our independence is we can choose whether we want to dedicate our life to become fully krishna conscious go back home and get out of this material world or we can stay here and try to think we can enjoy the, the features of this material energy and what are the features of the material energy? What is it? Nadanam, Najanam, Nasundarim, Kavitam, Vajagadishaga. Lord Chaitanya is teaching us, I don't want wealth. I don't want followers. I don't want the pleasures of the opposite sex. I don't even want to be known as a great orator of the Vedas. No distinction. What do I want? Janmani Janmani Ishwari Bhavatat Bhakti Arahoitu Kitei. I simply want to be your devotee life after life. When someone said to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you are the best of all devotees, Prabhupada said, Oh! 
Oh, devotee, that is very high. <laughs> yeah, we, we sometimes use that word quite, you know, ordinarily. But Prabhupada wanted to make a point, to be known as a devotee is something very, very exalted. That means one who is devoted to Krishna, always in devotional and, and service to Krishna. Yeah. So, to become a devotee is actually a very rare and very great opportunity. Why? Because it says that very few persons actually seriously take up this process of Krishna consciousness. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has increased that few number into more. He's made it easy. <laughs> He's made it really easy. Chant Hare Krishna. Haribo. <laughs> Dads. Take prasadam, read nice books, and just be a nice guy. <laughs> and even if somebody bothers you, which is always happens, don't worry about it. Because <laughs> if you if you don't learn to be tolerant in your devotional service, what happens is Krishna will throw things at you one after another after another just to show you. You're not tolerant here, but you're going to have to be tolerant here, <laughs> just to give you that message. So if we practice tolerance, chant, dance, take prasadam, read books, and hang around with nice people, hey, we got it. <laughs> this is the process of devotional service. I'm making it sound very simple, but that's the, actually I expanded the, the, uh, the whole thing. It's quite easy. So we have to develop that taste, and that taste comes by associating with devotees. And today, on this John Mastami day, is a very essential day where we can make tangible advancement towards, towards purifying our heart in Krishna consciousness. Simply by hearing that Krishna appears in, the, in this material world in order to perform his activities, and his appearance and birth in this world is a mystery. It is a great mystery. It's, it is, and if we can try to hear about that, try to think about it, try to understand it, and hear more from the acharyas who have, who have realization of these things. Gradually we get to know Krishna, and you actually know that Krishna is always with you. 24 hours a day, he is the closest thing with you, and he is your best friend. <laughs> And he is very, very kind. <laughs> that is Krishna. He's kind because he knows what's best for you. And he's always helping you to understand what's best for yourself. What is that? Worship me. What did he say? Manmana bhava mad bhakta mamnyaji mam namaskaru. Prabhupada would say, this is Krishna consciousness. Remember Krishna. Serve Krishna. Worship Krishna, we're doing that. We worship Krishna simply by coming to the temple. Even if we're not on the altar doing the formal worship, we're worshiping Krishna. And pay your obeisances, offer obeisances to the Lord. I would say these four things comprise all the activities of devotional service. But the nectar is chant, dance, and take prasad. <laughs> so on John Mastami, we do that every day, right? But on John Rastami, we do it in a big way. <laughs> because Krishna wants us to celebrate his appearance in a grand way. So he provides a great festival in honor of him himself and invites us all to come in and enjoy with him in that grand festival of Krishna consciousness. So this is the wonderful procedure of Krishna consciousness. So no matter how difficult you may experience the, the tendency of living in this material world or even the struggles to practice Krishna consciousness, don't ever consider it a difficulty. Consider it a blessing because it's bringing you closer and closer to Krishna as long as you stay fixed in your devotional service. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Shri Krishna Janmashtami Ki Jai, Sila Prabhupada Ki Jai,
Shri Pallada Nanda Maharaj Ki Jai Chandra Shekhar Maharaj Ki Jai Chandra Shekhar Maharaj Ki Jai Chandra Shekhar Maharaj Ki Jai That's another new one. I do a Zoom call once every two weeks to on this one. Uh, 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 Charlotte in, in North Carolina, the devotees come on, and there's a there's an elderly gentleman. His name is Pulatananda, so he reminds me of Maharaj because he's very intellectual and very uh, he knows the shastras. So when he gets on, he just keeps talking, and I can't say anything. <laughs> so I think that. So I thought, oh, okay, Pulatananda Maharaj has appeared again in a manifested form. And he's showing me how much he knows the philosophy. <laughs> and I'm really happy. I just listen to him because he's right on. He's, I mean, he's, he speaks so clearly, so authoritatively, quotes the Shastras, gives his personal examples of how he's realizing the process of devotional service. He takes over the whole show. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'm getting ready to go back to Ljubljana. <laughs> <laughs> so it was nice just to be reminded of Maharaj's association while I'm traveling. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hello Prabhupada Ki So now our announcers will announce.